Today we've got Elizabeth Joseph here. She, this is her first time in Geelong and she's uh, from San Fran working with OpenStack on the infrastructure team. So please give her a very warm welcome. Hello, thank you. Uh, so I'm here to talk about open source tools for distributed systems administration. Um, first to explain what that is. Um, the team I work on is distributed all over the world. Um, so I'll be talking about open source tools that we use in order to make our systems administration team work um, across time zones and geographic areas and offices and things. Uh, so quickly about myself. Um, yeah, I live in San Francisco uh, and I work for uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise on the OpenStack infrastructure team. So that means I'm paid by HP, but in my day-to-day -day work, I'm working on the OpenStack project infrastructure. Uh, so my colleagues are from several different companies and all over the world, as I said. I've been contributing to open source projects for over 10 years. I started doing packaging in Debian um, about 2006, um, and then sort of got into Ubuntu for a while. Um, I'm the co-author of the eighth edition of the official Ubuntu book, um, and I'm also working on an OpenStack book now, too, that will be finished someday. Um, quickly overview what we're going to talk about here. Um, I want to introduce you sort of to our team, uh, that the OpenStack infrastructure team. Um, the continuous integration system that we use inside of OpenStack, I'll do a quick overview of that. I know there have been talks about that specifically at LCA before, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, I'll talk about how code review works in our infrastructure team, um, and then the automated testing that goes along with the code review. Um, and then the other collaboration tools that we use to do our day-to-day -day work, and also like human-focused strategies we use, like meetings and other things. So when I started getting involved with open source, um, there were a few ways that open source projects hosted infrastructure. Um, a lot of them, when I started, were hosted on SourceForge. Uh, of course, now you have a lot of projects on GitHub. Um, in the Ubuntu project, we use Launchpad. Um, these are all big code hosting services. So they're not run by the project themselves. Um, or a, a company will manage something, um, like the company behind an open source project. Like for Ubuntu, Canonical hosts a lot of the things. Of course, for Fedora, Red Hat will host the things. So there's either a company or a hosting service that hosts everything. Um, when you want to submit changes to the project, um, you may have used a mailing list to submit a patch, or there may be some sort of bug report or ticketing system that you submit patches to. Um, and then, for the, and these are for infrastructure changes, sorry. Um, so when I was working with Ubuntu, we would submit a ticket to Canonical IS, and they would make a change to the infrastructure to support the thing that we needed in the community. Um, this meant that in the case of Canonical IS, their, their, their IT team would determine the priority of our requests. Similarly, when you use code hosting, uh, you can't usually make requests to the code hosting service. You have what, what they give you. Um, there's sometimes feedback mechanisms, but you don't really have control of what you're going to have there. Um, and so a lot of open source projects run this way. I mean, you have what GitHub gives you. Um, but in OpenStack, we sort of started going this way, but we thought we are a cloud product, OpenStack is. Um, we have a really big pool of open source talent in the infrastructure team that we started building. So we thought maybe there's a better way than having someone else host our code or depending on a company to host it which is how we built our OpenStack infrastructure team. Um, so we host all of our entire infrastructure. Um, you may find GitHub projects for OpenStack, but those are actually just mirrors of our repository. We run our own Git farm um, that's reachable at git.openstack.org. Um, so as an infrastructure team, uh, our job is pretty much making sure the developers can do their job. So we run, in addition to a continuous integration system, we run all the wikis, even things like IRC bots, etherpads, any, anything that the developer will inter interact with is all first open source software and also run by our team. Um, at one point, we had a translation service that was hosted elsewhere with TransFX, but then they went closed source and we couldn't use them anymore because of that. So we learned our lesson, no more other people hosting our stuff. Um, Anyone can submit patches to our code repository for infrastructure because our entire infrastructure is open source. So all of our public configs, um, all of our system configs, um, not passwords, because uh, that would be silly. <laughs> um, those are handled internally in an internal Git repository that only the, the root members have access to. Um, but since anyone can submit changes to our project, um, it means that your 
uh, you don't have to submit a ticket to us to get something done. You can start working on it yourself, which I'll get into more. And we all work remotely. Um, nobody on the team goes into an office, as far as I know. Um, we've got people, we've got several people in the US. Um, that's sort of just because that's where we started off things. Um, we have a, a contributor in Russia. Uh, we have one in Australia, <laughs> Josh. Um, then we have another uh, core member, uh, uh, and she lives in Spain. So we're sort of covering the time zones there. Um, you don't really need to read this list of stuff we run. Um, it's sort of basic stuff for a project, things that open source projects need. Um, AskBot is ask.openstack.org. It's a Q and a question and answer site. Um, as I said, like IRC bots and etherpads and paste bins and other things. Um, but we run a bunch of servers. And then we also run a fleet of, I think it's actually less now because one of our clouds went away, but like 800 machines that we run all of our tests on, um, which is managed by a tool called NodePool. Um, so when we started this infrastructure team, we were thinking, you know, what, what can we do to leverage the OpenStack continuous integration system we have already? Um, so OpenStack's continuous integration system itself has over 800 projects. Um, I should actually look that up because it may be even more than that. I updated this slide in last month, so it may be like 850 or so. But there's a lot of OpenStack projects. And in OpenStack, since it's sort of a modular cloud thing, um, all the projects have to work together. So we're doing a lot of uh, integration testing, uh, functional testing uh, between the projects. Um, we also have what we call a gated trunk in our infrastructure. Um, for the code, so tests are performed before code merges into the repository. Um, this is partially done because OpenStack is a massive project across lots and lots of different companies. And if one person at one company breaks the master branch and no one else for lots of other companies can get their work done, that's a very bad state to be in. So we make sure everything passes all the tests and actually works for things we test. Um, again, since we're working across lots of different companies, we want to make sure all the code that goes into OpenStack is syntactically clean. So we have linters and, on Python and also the infrastructure stuff, which I'll talk about, to make sure that everyone's writing pretty similar code. So when someone opens up a new piece of software inside of OpenStack, they're pretty sure that the format and, and policies within uh, the language are going to be pretty consistent. Of course, in reality, that's totally not true, but <laughs> that's the dream. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we have changes coming in every minute, I mean, multiple times a minute in the OpenStack project. So all of the testing that we had to do in the continuous integration system has to be automatic. So we're using a bunch of different tools uh, for this continuous integration system. And again, it's all open source. So other companies and other projects have started to replicate this. Um, <coughs> we're using Launchpad uh, for uh, authentication. Um, that's sort of a legacy thing. Um, a lot of some of the original OpenStack people were Ubuntu people, and they used Launchpad. So Launchpad got pulled into a lot of our things, but we've had a really hard time breaking ourselves free of that, um, partially because we don't have a good bug solution for OpenStack, um, and authentication is really just easy with this. Um, but on the team, we're writing an OpenStack ID service, which will be in, uh, an authentication system. Um, of course, we use Git for the back end. Um, we use Garrett for code review, which I'll show you some screenshots of. Um, we also have this tool called Zool, which is our gatekeeper. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, that takes all of the requests that come in through Garrett and feeds them into Jenkins to actually run the tests um, indirectly through a tool called Gearman because we have multiple Jenkins masters. So we have like eight Jenkins masters. They don't know about each other, but Gearman will distribute the jobs in an intelligent way. Um, and then we have Jenkins, of course. Uh, we have a tool we built called Jenkins Job Builder, which makes it really, really easy to create Jenkins jobs. Because if you've ever written a Jenkins job before, you know how hard it is. And teaching a thousand developers in OpenStack how to write a Jenkins job was something we really didn't want to do. So you can put it in YAML format. It's a very simple format. And then developers can submit changes and change their tests. And then we have a, something called DevStack Gate, which prepares all of the images that run OpenStack for testing to go against them. And then NodePool manages our fleet of 800 plus servers that all the tests run on. So this is sort of the workflow from the perspective of me on the OpenStack infrastructure team. So you will submit changes through Git review, um, which is sort of like a, a pull request, but it sends it to the code review system. As I said, the code review system sends it to Zool, which sends it to Gearman. 
um, and then to the Jenkins servers. Um, from there, it goes off into the slaves and does its testing. So all of this is the continuous integration system we use in OpenStack. It's pretty cool stuff, but the infrastructure team uses it too. So as I said, we had this team we put together and we were like, hey, we're open source people and we want to write this and do this infrastructure collaboratively so anyone can submit patches. So it made sense for us to use the code review system that the rest of the project used. So we decided adding a bunch of tests over time. So because we work on OpenStack, um, all of our, pretty much all of our system scripts, they're either written in Bash, either in Bash or in Python. Um, so the first thing we, one of the first things we added was just doing the same like uh, linting checks that the rest of OpenStack uses. So we're using Flake 8. Um, I think we've actually, we're sort of migrating, doing more um, talks, testing and stuff now. Um, but PEP8 and PyFlakes, Flake 8 does that. Um, and then we're using Puppet for our infrastructure. Um, that's somewhat incidental. We don't have a special affinity for Puppet. It just happened to be the one we got running first. Um, so in that way, we decided to start running to Puppet tests. So we started with Puppet Parser Validate and Puppet Lint. Um, the Parser Validate is sort of like, I don't know if you'd call it unit testing, um, but it's really like simple like tests to make sure that the thing that you wrote probably should, should run. Um, in isolation. Um, Puppet lint is another just, uh, code linter, uh, which makes sure your formatting is correct, um, because again, we have people from all kinds of companies and lots of people contributing to our Puppet configs. So we wanted them to look pretty standardized. Um, over the past year, we've also added some Puppet, puppet application tests. Uh, so we're using Beaker RSpec to tests our public, test our Puppet configs in a more comprehensive way to make sure that they actually run and they actually do what we want them to do. And so we've added a bunch of tests to our Puppet systems um, to check for different functionalities with each change. Um, we also know the syntax of several of our XML files. So we'll start, we started adding checks for those. Um, we also learned that humans are really bad at the alphabet, um, <laughs> but computers, they're really good at it. Um, so now for several of our project files, in order to keep them alphabetized, we run alphabetiz alphabetization checks on them um, to make sure that everything's listed in the proper order, because um, people get this wrong all the time. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I think is a lot of fun is we also check IRC channel permissions um, because when we add things to our infrastructure, bots to our infrastructure, we want to make sure that we have the right permissions on them if, in case something happens um, so we can get access to that channel and don't need to go through Freenode staff. Um, so we have a bot that hops on Freenode and makes sure that the infrastructure team is added um, and then it has you know, the right permissions in that way. So, when people add something, and I think it has to be part of, yeah, it has to be access bot part of as well. Um, so it act, checks some various IRC permissions. So you can't add a bot to your channel until you've satisfied certain criteria that these scripts check for. So these all run in the same continuous integration system that the rest of OpenStack does. Um, it also means we're using Garrett for code review. Um, and that peer review is super important to us. Um, at my old job, um, it was, I was working at a sysadmin shop. There were like three of us. And we'd sort of have our morning meeting. It was a really small company. Like we were deploying to a couple museums and a shipyard and other things in the city. Um, but we'd sort of meet in the morning and do an analysis of what happened overnight and what we needed to work on for the day. So then we'd go off and we'd fight our fires and we'd fix things on the servers and we'd log in manually because, you know, it was that time. <laughs> um, and we'd, we'd go and fix things. Then in the afternoon, we might get back together and say, hey, what did you work on? And we'd look at each other's work and say, oh, you know, I would have done it this way next time, or yeah, I should have done it that way. Um, but moving into this team meant that we're doing code review for every single change. Um, we try not to log into the servers and make changes. That's what Puppet is for. Um, and so every single change that happens to our infrastructure is peer reviewed, and it has to be reviewed and approved by two other core members of the team. I think there's nine core members now. Um, so it allows us to have, instead of just everyone going off in their own way and fighting fires, we're all collaborati collaboratively looking at every single change that's submitted to the infrastructure. Um, it's also provided us a really good infrastructure for developing new solutions. So there's a work in progress mode in Garrett. So you can put up your idea of what you want to change in the infrastructure, like a really rough draft of what you want to do and just mark it as work in progress and ask people to collaborate on it and leave comments and so you can figure out a solution together, which is sort of where we start getting into what's really important in a distributed team and having something there. Like we're not just dumping stuff in a paste bin. 
um, we're actually using a collaborative tool for you know, tooling for code review in order to share our uh, uh, proposals to the infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, it also means anyone can commit code to our infrastructure. Um, so you don't have to go through a special process to finally get the access to the repository because technically speaking, we all could just manually edit Git because we have root on the servers. But <laughs> um, through our processes, like no one really has full commit access. You can also self-approve things, but the, you know, socially that's not, not acceptable and there's a record of that. Um, but everyone has sort of the same um, uh, uh, playing field here. Like we're all submitting changes. We all have to get it reviewed by a couple of core reviewers and other people in our community. Um, and no one person is responsible for breaking everything. It's, it's probably three people who are responsible, so the person who wrote it. <laughs> um, but it makes us really collaborative because we're all feeling responsible and ownership for these changes. Um, and it also means that anyone can contribute resources to our infrastructure. Um, so one of the examples I really like is that I hate phones, and I think everyone in the infrastructure team just hates phones. We don't like talking to each other, apparently, except for on IRC. <laughs> Um, so someone said, I want an asterisk server because they wanted to be able to talk to each other using voices. And we said, eh, that doesn't sound interesting. Because um, <laughs> why did you just use IRC? Um, so a couple, a few guys from Red Hat came over um, and they wrote all the public configs and they worked with us to deploy it and test it. And they were the ones who devoted all the resources to getting the asterisk server up. And we didn't really have to do anything. We had to review their code and we have to work with them with testing. Um, but we did not determine the fact that that asterisk server came up. It was a company and a few individuals from that company who came in and said, we want this thing, we're going to do the work. You know, just, you need to do the little bits to help us along, um, which is really nice. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, hopefully somewhat okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to give sort of an example of how Garrett does inline commenting. So this is the code review system. And I love this example because it's so funny. I wrote this change, by the way. And if you can read what it says here, it's very funny. Because it says, if robots.txt does not equal undefined. <laughs> okay. I was kind of tired, and I think I rewrote this a few times, and that's how I ended up with like a double negative there. <laughs> but Spencer's like, you know, you could just if robots.txt. Oh, OK, right? Sorry. <laughs> But see, that works, though. You know, if I was doing this on my own and I had just fixed the thing, I'm like, oh, it's fine, whatever. But we have code review, so people can check these silly things and actually make us not do crazy things like this. Um, in our infrastructure, we also automatically deploy everything. So after a change gets tested and approved by all these core reviewers um, and then merged into the repository, um, either Puppet will pick it up and apply the change or if it's a change to one of our continuously deployed pieces of software, um, Puppet will just update um, with a VCS repo module um, the code, and it'll get uh, restarted and working in our infrastructure. And that mostly works. <laughs> Fortunately, our customers are developers. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not a very you know complicated mode for continuous delivery, um, but it uh, works for us, mostly. <laughs> so. When I talk about this stuff, um, people are sometimes surprised that we don't really log into our servers and um, uh, we don't have lots of, we have systems administrators on our team who are not logging into servers. I mean, I spent two years on the team without having access to any of the servers and I'm like, wow, I don't even feel like a sysadmin anymore. <laughs> um, but it really, it really was possible actually to do it all through, through code review. I mean, I was still submitting patches to Puppet and I was still restarting services, I just hadn't logged into the machines. So we have a few tools to make this easier for those people like me who spent a couple of years not actually having access to the servers. Um, the one is uh, we take uh, we keep metrics with Cacti. I'm sure well, many people have used Cacti before, but if not, it looks like this. Um, it's just graphs showing things like CPU usage, RAM usage. Um, this has the benefit of and Cacti.openstack.org is available like on the internet. Anyone can go to it. So the benefit of using something like this is kind of twofold. First of all. Um, for new contributors or people who don't have logins to the machines, they can see what's going on. So for a little while, um, actually for several months, um, we had this problem of one of our servers filling up with logs. And the problem with the server filling up with logs in our CI system is that when it filled up with logs, Jenkins got really unhappy and everything stopped. 
So we were all at a conference one day, and the log server filled up, and nobody knew about it, and all of us, you know, people who had access to the machines didn't really know what to do. I mean, didn't know about it, right? Because we're at a conference not paying attention to IRC. Um, but someone in the community was able to go look at Cacti and figure out what was wrong. They're like, hey, I've, your log server has filled up before. <laughs> um, maybe it's happened again. So they look at Cacti, and they, look at this, they drill down to which server it was, and they were able to grab us and say, not only like something is wrong, everything in OpenStack is broken, they were able to say, the server disk filled up, someone get online and fix this. Um, which was really nice. It made the community feel empowered because they were able to actually do something. Even if they couldn't fix it, they could figure out what the problem was. Um, the other thing this is really useful for is other open stack project or open source projects and companies who are looking to replicate our infrastructure. They don't need to come and ask us what size our Garrett server is. They have all the data they need in Cacti. Like they can see how much RAM it uses and how much CPU is typically used on the machine. Um, and then make sort of smart decisions. They still do ask us, and then we tell them to look at Cacti. <laughs> um, but it's, it ends up being a really useful tool. Um, of course, Cacti is not, you don't have to use Cacti, but it happens to be the one we use. Um, interestingly, we don't actually do any active monitoring. Um, partially, that's just a resource thing with our team. We just decided that wasn't an important part of our infrastructure, and developers will tell us when things are broken, right? I don't know. If anyone, we, we need help, so if anyone wants to come help us out, <laughs> Stand up Nagios. Just don't send us alerts because we don't like them. <laughs> um, so another thing, uh, since we're using Puppet, um, we wanted a way for our people submitting changes to our infrastructure um, to see what was going on. Um, we didn't want to spit out syslogs to everyone because it turns out a lot of crazy programs put crazy things in the syslog that you don't want fully public. Um, we didn't learn this the hard way, but it was pretty close. <laughs> Like, let's just publish all of our server logs. Oh, don't do that. Um, so we have a tool called Puppet Board. Um, it'll show you, um, it, it's actually sort of developed not to be run publicly, so we had to shut off some of the things in order to run this on the public internet. Like some of the search things, you didn't want to have to be able to search up, search the higher variables which hold all of our secret data. Um, but it gives you a dashboard for showing you what the servers are doing. Um, so when you submit a change to our infrastructure, it gets approved, it gets merged, and you're waiting around saying, did that service restart? Did my change get applied? Did anything work? And so when we didn't have a dashboard, they'd come into the infra channel and say, hey, infra root, can you log in and check to see if, if my thing ran, and if not, did it break? Um, but Puppet Board actually allows you to see. So this is just a screenshot of the main page um, where it lists a bunch of our servers. We're totally running AFS, by the way. Um, um, and so you get to see, you get to click on these and you get different reports from the servers. So it'll tell you whether things executed and whether a cron, cron job was added or other things that would have, may have been part of your change. Um, and this, this was pretty much one of my favorite things when I joined Infra because I, I, I was always waiting around for my changes to merge. I'm like, did it work? Did it work? So if it didn't work, it'll also show you errors. And so you can get to, get to work on writing your next patch right away. You don't need to wait around for someone to tell you what, what went wrong. You can just get to writing your patch to make sure things actually worked. Um, we're also surprisingly good at documentation for an infrastructure project. Um, at my old job, we had a wiki. I'm sure many people have a wiki. <laughs> It was pretty bad. We tried, um, but it just wasn't part of our culture. Um, but I think partially because our team is distributed and also because we're, um, we have a really good system for writing it up. I mean, it's all in, in uh, Markdown uh, that we have actually pretty good documentation. So our documentation, do I have a screenshot? No. So it's pretty much just every single service we have will link to the specific puppet file um, that you can change to change the configuration, um, and then we'll link to the documentation for that piece of software, um, and then other things, how to submit bugs, um, and other things, and then also specific things about that service. So like for our Elasticsearch system, the Elk stack that we run, um, we have like little drawings inside of the documentation showing exactly how it's set up and how to perform certain specific tasks. Um, and then when we find the documentation is wrong, we're actually pretty good at updating it. Um, we also have specifications when we run through new software projects that we're deploying. So I deployed um, a new translation server uh, last year. And as part of that specification, documentation was a big part of that. We have a whole setting, uh, heading inside of our specification for documentation. 
to make sure it gets documented so that if I decide to run off to Australia, someone else can fix the translation server. Um, we can't actually handle everything through git commits. Um, we do sometimes need to log into a server. Um, typically for this, for us, um, it'll be something like we need to look at a log file because we don't publish those anywhere. Um, we may also need to interact with MySQL directly um, and because of how we're set up, um, it's easiest to do that uh, with a MySQL client actually um, inside of the, in one of the machines in the infrastructure. Um, we also do, uh, we're, we're moving away from this, but we were doing a lot of manual work when we initially deploy a system into our infrastructure. So we'd have all the puppet files configured and everything all ready to go, but someone actually had to type in some OpenStack commands to launch a server. Um, we're moving away from that. We're trying to automate all the things. So that may be less of a problem soon. Um, we also found that we can't really do complicated migrations through Git. You can't just update a version number and hope everything goes okay, it turns out. Um, and so migrations and upgrades and things, you may need more manual intervention, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, how we handle that. And then of course passwords, as I mentioned, we have, they have to be privately managed, um, but we do keep those inside of Git um, in a private repository. So when we need to do maintenance, um, what we typically do is we get together in an IRC meeting and we'll talk about the maintenance that needs to be done. So in this case, um, we were, what were we doing in this one? Um, yes, right, so we were making changes to some projects on Garrett. So we met, in IRC, we met in an IRC meeting, we planned out what we needed to do and when people would be around, and then we put together all the steps in an etherpad. An etherpad is a collaborative editor, again, open source, and then we just had every single step defined in this etherpad. So the problem statement, what we're trying to do, and then the steps written out you know, in, in words, and then also the exact commands that we're going to run. So this allowed us to do some peer review of the process that we're going to use. Um, it helped us not make mistakes when we were actually running through it. Um, and then when we all sat together in the chat channel to actually do the maintenance, we added our nicknames next to each one of the things. So I'm Pilea2, and then there's Nibbleizer there, and Fungi up top. Um, we're all adding our names, like I'm gonna do this step, I'm gonna do this step. So we're working together in the etherpad, we're all logged into the servers, and then we're also collaborating on IRC to make sure this all happens. We don't like phones, so all on IRC. <laughs> Um, we also, as I mentioned, we have IRC channels. Um, so in, on Freenode, uh, we have OpenStack Infra, which is sort of our main channel. We're pretty much talkative all throughout the day. Um, there are about four pe 400 people idling in that channel at any given time, because if anything goes wrong with OpenStack, development-wise, people will know first in the Infra channel. So lots of people looking at what we're doing. Um, it doesn't feel that big. I was actually pretty surprised when I looked at how many people were in there. <laughs> um, we also recently spun off a separate incident channel. So if something goes really wrong with our infrastructure, it turns out our infra channel gets full of people saying, the things are broken, everything's wrong, house is on fire. We wanted to be able to separate ourselves out into a separate channel in order to address those concerns without having people bothering us all the time or asking us about other projects or asking us for code reviews. We want a separate place where we could just join that channel and focus on exact, so this specific incident. Um, that's been a huge help to our team and actually a pretty new, um, Thing that we've started doing. Um, we also leverage uh, an OpenStack project sprint channel. Um, some projects in OpenStack, they do in-person mid-cycle sprints, um, but we found that we work really well together online, it turns out. So we do sometimes do in-person sprints, um, but we decided that we wanna just do them on our own sometimes on the internet so we don't have to travel anywhere. Um, so we joined the sprint channel and what typically happens is for one or two days, um, continuously going over 24 hours-ish, time zones are a problem, sorry Josh, <laughs> um, we'll just be hacking on one specific thing that we wanna get done. Um, so last year, um, we were doing some modifications to our puppet modules, and it was a huge project. Things needed to merge in a certain order, and everything needed to be done sort of consecutively, or continuously and consecutively, like all together. Um, so we joined the Sprint channel for a couple of days and we just went through those reviews, worked through problems together and focused on specifically those things rather than the day-to-day -day stuff that needs to be done um, uh, maintenance-wise in the project. 
Uh, we also realized we needed to meet regularly. Um, we can all sort of go off and do our own thing work-wise every day, but if we don't come together once a week and sort of reevaluate our priorities and chat together, um, again, we're chatting constantly in the Infra channel, but a meeting once a week, one hour long, gives us time to get together and, and prioritize our thoughts, uh, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we can shift priorities during those meetings. If someone's working on something that's really not important and we need to get something else done, the meetings give us a stopping point um, for being able to say, you know, we need to shift resources around some way. Um, all the meetings are logged. So if we don't have uh, the opportunity to see a meeting, we can go back and, and view it later. Um, this is true for all OpenStack projects. Um, we have eavesdrop.openstack.org, which hosts both the meeting logs and full channel logs. So the OpenStack Infra channel, the Infra Incident channel, OpenStack Sprint, these are all publicly logged and available online. Um, we also actually do use our paste bin quite a bit, even though we have Garrett for collaborating on changes. If someone wants to, um, they, they say, hey, Liz, can you dig into the logs? I need, I need to know why this certain service is failing. So I may dig into the logs and I'll just dump it in a paste bin. Um, so again, I'm not screen sharing with anyone. I'm not giving them the entire contents of the logs, but we use a paste bin to be able to share specific pieces. Um, and then another thing we do is we have in-person meetups um, at the OpenStack Summit uh, well, twice a year, so every six months. All the OpenStack developers and the users get together at this massive thousands of people OpenStack conference um, that happen all over the world. Um, and we have uh, infra infrastructure focused sessions. Um, even though we do work really well together online, um, we found that finally getting together with these people that you work with every day and seeing them face to face, it's not just something that's nice, it's been really essential to cohesion in our team and general happiness and sometimes getting out of our house because we all work from home. <laughs> Um, so getting to do that in-person collaboration is super important to our team. Um, so regardless of the company we work for, we try really hard to make sure that all of us are there. It doesn't always happen, um, but we work hard to make sure that we're together. So we'll have a, a dinner together while we're there, probably a lot of beer. <laughs> um, and then, and then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be good for the next six months, then we can go home. <laughs> um, and as I said, we don't use voice or video calls in our infrastructure. Um, just because we don't really like them. <laughs> um, we seem to work well on IRC and doing all our things through these collaborative tools I talked about. So I, we don't really feel the need to use any other tooling. Um, so it's not all awesome. Um, as Josh can attest to, um, time zones are a really hard problem. Um, I'd love to chat with anyone. I mean, Australia is a perfect people to chat with, right? You guys are on the wrong side of the time zone all the time. <laughs> um, but it's really hard. Um, I mean, when, when one person is added as a root or core member of our infrastructure team and they're in a time zone that's not well represented, which means they're outside the US, sorry. <laughs> um, I, the person in, in the other region, I mean, I've I known this from Josh and Yolanda has been added recently in Spain. Um, it, they, they, they feel it's, really, it's re the real struggle to feel cohesion with the rest of the team when you're not awake at the same time. Um, Additionally, I can speak from myself. When I was first added as a root and a core member, something would break and no one would be around. And I'd be like, oh no, like, I have root on the box, but I have no idea how to fix this thing. Like, or if I fix it and it's really bad and I break everything. Um, so I'm sure that that's much worse for people who actually are like, in a time zone of their own and they're the only one around. Um, so it, it may, it, you know, for me, even when I'm alone in the US, like everyone else is you know, off doing something. Um, it's, there's a reluctance to land changes when no one else is around because you're the only one who can fix them. Um, it also makes it slower for onboarding. Um, I mean, I'm there with my teammates every day, throughout the day, and if some, some maintenance tax, task comes up and they say, oh, I'm gonna do the thing, and I wait, like, wait, wait, I haven't done that yet, can you train me on that? And it's not really um, planned, it's sort of just ad hoc. That's how we learn things in our team. And it doesn't really work when someone is in an off time zone. Um, so it usually means that the people in the off time zones are either working late or starting early in order to get the team time, um, which is not really fair. Um, but the only, the only way we've really found that improves that, aside from them destroying their sleep schedule, making their families unhappy, um, <laughs> is adding more people in that time zone, um, which we also struggle to do because when you're in the off time zone, again, you're not getting the mentorship and collaboration from the community. Um, 
that you need to become someone who is really core inside the project. Um, so if anyone else has ideas for this, I'd love to chat later. Um, but time zones are definitely the thing that we struggle most with. Um, things like IRC meetings that are logged, ether pads and everything. I mean, they can go back. If you're on an off time zone, you can read about what we did. But it's really not the same as actually being there. But it's actually mostly pretty great. Um, I love working on the project that I work on. Um, and our team always needs help. Um, HPE is not hiring at the moment, I don't think. Um, but Again, we work with a bunch of different companies. Um, IBM's involved the infrastructure, um, Rackspace, Mirantis, various companies. And usually if you come along and start helping our infrastructure team a lot, um, for one, you get experience in a real infrastructure um, that has things that are running on it and things that are important. Um, but also, um, a lot of companies end up hiring people who are working on our infrastructure. Um, and then you have an actual job. And you can work in your pajamas with your cat. It's great. <laughs> um, so yes, um, that, was, that was all I had. Um, you can grab me at um, lyz at um, That's the email address I check. Uh, sorry, HP people in the room. <laughs> I have an HP e address, but I don't check it that often. Um, <laughs> no, you can grab me on IRC or Twitter. Um, and then that, again, is the link to the resources for the OpenStack infrastructure. Um, and again, everything's public. So if you go to that link, um, you can find links to all the things that I shared in the slides. So all the resources and cacti and puppet board and all the things. So yeah. All right, questions? No questions. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So other than the pajamas and the cat, is there, what, what do you see the other big reason for not having video calls or voice calls? You say you don't like them, but do you find they're not as productive as what you do on IRC? Um, so the big thing is that they're not logged. Um, even if they are recorded, it's really hard and boring to watch someone on a video, especially when they're, you know, they're talking about their cats, right? And then they finally get into what they actually want to talk about. Um, so the big thing is, is recording and accountability. Um, I also don't, I just don't like video and voice. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's the big one. So you mentioned documentation would probably be quite important, even more so in a distributed team and for out of hours time zone people. Um, and you also said that you previously worked in a company where wikis just never got updated, but now it's really good and well maintained. Do you have any tips for how to develop that we write documentation wiki culture? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, so for us, it, it was sort of. Um, a sink or swim thing. Like if we don't have good documentation, then we are going to res be responsible for that thing for the rest of time. So if we ever want to go on vacation, we have to write good documentation. And our team has a really good culture of taking vacations, it turns out. <laughs> um, so we, we value our time and we make sure each other, you know, we make sure like we're getting time off. So part, part of like the culture of, of being able to take time off is having a culture of keeping documentation. So when you're encouraging people to take care of themselves, not do everything themselves, it becomes really important to document. And it sort of happened organically for us because of that culture of making sure we're taking time. Um, I mean, my team's still full of workaholics. Um, <laughs> um, but we do like fully unplug and just take off sometimes throughout the year. Um, so documentation, that just sort of happens. Um, also, having a really good way to do it is helpful. Um, wikis. Like, I still believe it's a really good idea to have a wiki, but they just never work in practice for us. Like, having them, they, they, our, our documentation actually goes through our code review system. So we're writing it in Markdown, and then we're having it actually processed by our review system. It's being, there are automated tests that run against our documentation. And then it's published on a really pretty looking website. Um, so it's, it's also within our workflow. So we're not having to, like, you know, context switch and go over to the wiki and write stuff in the wiki. We just have to do another patch, just like we do any other patches. So I need to do a patch to write the config file. I need to write the patch to do the puppet configuration. And then I need to write the patch to do the documentation. So keeping it all in one workflow has helped us a lot. What do you use for task allocation and sort of visibility on what the rest of the team are working on? Um, so task visibility. Um, so 
We were using uh, the bug tracking in Launchpad, um, and that was sort of how we handled um, just what, what outstanding tasks. We didn't really have a good task system. It was all driven by bugs. Um, we're now using tooling called Storyboard, um, but it's not really working well for us. It's sort of, we're trying this new thing. Um, it doesn't have email notifications. It's a serious problem for me. I think those are, did they get added? I think they're getting added soon. Um, but uh, so that's, that's part of it. So we use that. And then we also use our, um, our weekly meetings to check in on things. So we have high priority projects. And I, I briefly mentioned specifications that we write. Um, so we have specs.openstack.org slash infra, maybe. If you go to specs.openstack.org, you can find the infrastructure team. And that has a list of all of our projects that were, like the big projects we're working on. Um, and then there's a subset of, of priority tasks that we're working on, and then a bunch of ones that we're just sort of working on. Um, since the team is relatively small, we've got nine core people and then probably a dozen people who are on, like, I, I consider part of the team as well, who are working on things at any given time. Um, we sort of know what each other's working on, and meetings help us sort of sync up on that. So a mixture of bug reports, specifications, and then the weekly check-ins. Hi, um, there are a couple of different tasks that you'll be facing, right? There's the ad hoc tasks people are just going to do right away. They're the tasks that are going to last for a couple of days and weeks. They're the tasks that will need to be done in the future. And then there are the repeated tasks that happen every month or so. Do you have a system to track those and uh, claim tasks and that kind of stuff? Um, so again, with those, they're, they're mostly handled through the meetings. So um, if you're talking about the and IRC, so when something comes up, we're all in the channel and everyone's paying attention. Like, if you're working, you're looking at the IRC channel. So if something happens, you know, we'll either work on it in channel, we'll pop over the incident channel, but we sort of just work together and just chat and say like, hey, who's gonna be doing what to fix things? Um, for more long-term projects, um, against the specifications and checking in in meetings, um, who's working on what? Um, and then we don't, I mean, so Storyboard has a system of tasks, so you can assign things to people, but we haven't really been good at using that. Like, tooling hasn't really worked for us for assigning specific tasks. We just sort of know that, you know, Clark's working on the thing, and Jeremy's working on the thing, and Liz always works on translations things for some reason. <laughs> um, so we sort of know what other people are working on. Um, for periodic tasks, we also check in at meetings. So one of the things we have is sort of a standing meeting item is, is project renames. So project renames in OpenStack are really disruptive. We have to shut down Garrett. We have to run a bunch of commands. Um, we've automated a lot of it, but some of it's not being automated yet. Um, but it's kind of disruptive because Garrett is down. And the code review system is the central like beating heart of what OpenStack development is. Um, so we, that's a periodic task that we'll talk about in a meeting. We'll find time when we're not flying all over the world and there's at least three of us sitting at a computer at the same time <laughs> to do that task. So yeah, meetings. Any more questions? No. All right, thank you. Thanks, Lex.